My guest today is Canadian screenwriter, editor, and director known for his high concept filmmaking style and use of color. He made a splash with his directorial debut, the cult classic Hobo with a Shotgun, starring Rutger Hauer. His films include the critically acclaimed standout segments from ABC, the ABCs of Death and his slumber party alien abduction for VHS, for VHS 2. His viral horror short, One Last Dive, has been called the scariest one minute movie ever. And I would have to agree. Uh, he's he's the co-creator and executive producer of the groundbreaking docu series Dark Side of the Ring and Tales from the Ter- Territories for Vice TV. He co-wrote and directed his latest feature, Kids vs. Aliens, which is the sci-fi horror movie equivalent to being repeatedly shot out of a Dayglo confetti cannon to the soundtrack of Mortal Kombat, or something <laughs> along those lines. Jason, it's a pleasure to see you. Oh, thank you so much. That was like the best intro I've ever been given. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, you were born and raised in the coastal town of Dartmouth, Nova Scotia in Canada. Your father was in construction and your mother was a teacher. What were you like as a young child growing up in Dartmouth? Oh, my gosh. Um, I was a, like my mom would say, like I was a very hyper kid. Um, I was very busy. Uh, she would have to like lock my door like at night because I would like escape my bedroom and try to knock on the doors of other neighbors in the neighborhood trying to get their kids to come out and play with me. Um, (laughs) uh, So I was a handful. um, But I guess like, uh, I like I'm still like so nostalgic, like for my childhood, I had a great childhood. And my parents were amazing and really like encouraged me to like follow my dreams and they would um just get into the things that like i was into um like when i first started getting into like properties like teenage mutant ninja turtles and ghostbusters they would like fuel my um my like excitement for those things and uh and you know for christmas i would get action figures or the soundtrack you know, like to one of those things. And, um, and it just, it's, it stuck with me like so much, uh, throughout my whole life. Um, so at this point, I usually ask my guests what scared them the most as a child, a ghost in the attic or a monster under the bed. But I think I know the answer because its influence can be seen in some of your work. Uh, mm-hmm. Around 11.20 p.m. on the night of October 4th, 1967, it was reported that something glowing had crashed into the waters of Shag Harbor, about three hours away from your child at home. It was a Wednesday. It was a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Many witnesses on land, sea, and from the air saw the object before the crash. The object was never officially identified and was referred to as an unidentified flying object by the Canadian government and military. The incident is known as the Shag Harbor UFO incident. Stories of this combined with the 1993 release of the movie Fire in the Sky was a one-two punch cementing aliens and alien abductions as one of your most potent childhood fears. I read you kept a baseball bat under the bed to protect yourself from aliens, but you'd also check out books on UFOs from the library. Why do you suppose we are drawn to the things that scare us the most? Oh, that's a good question. You know, um, I remember when I was a kid, uh, when I was really young, maybe I was five or six, probably five. uh, My grandfather, I was sitting in his living room and the original uh, black and white King Kong came on television and we were watching it. And as soon as King Kong like popped up on the screen, I like yelled at him to like, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. <laughs> and he would change it to uh, Stompin' Tom Connors, which was like an old country show. And I'd watch that for a bit. And then I would say to him, ah, turn it back on, go back, go back. And then he would go back when we'd watch King Kong and then King Kong would pop out again and I would get scared and, and tell him to turn it off, turn it off. And we watched like the whole movie that way. And um, I think like, you know, as a kid, I was I, like, that was like the, my entryway into horror or like, you know, being intrigued by it. And like, I, I knew like the things that like scared me, like growing up, I was still like super like intrigued by them. Like I, I would, I would want to know more about them. And so like the King Kong movies were some of the first movies, like I got into King Kong and Godzilla films. 
um, because I was terrified of them, but I wanted to see them and try and conquer, I guess, that fear maybe. And the same thing happened when I saw like fire in the sky. It was like the the trailer for that movie came on TV and just the trailer, you know, it showed a guy getting abducted by aliens and it said based on a true story. And so like, I remember like my parents, like at that time trying to convince me, like, I don't have to turn a light on in the hallway um, or like in my bedroom and that there's no such thing as ghosts and aliens. But then the TV is telling me <laughs> it's for real. It's based on a true story. Um, and the same thing, like I wanted, I went to the library, like all the libraries in my town and got every book on aliens and UFO sightings and abductions. And I just, I wanted to know it all so that again, I could kind of like, I felt like by knowing more about it, it would help like my fears maybe a little bit more, I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, just as a quick side tangent, I also was introduced to a horror through Godzilla. Actually, I was oh, going to really? put this guy up. Yeah. But that's we awesome. couldn't find a room for him. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, like I remember like uh, like say, like Godzilla. Um, I, it wasn't until I saw like Mecha Godzilla in like one of the movies that I was like, it stopped being scary for me and it just got really cool and i remember trying to like recreate mecha godzilla with like cardboard boxes and, awesome. and, and stuff yeah i used to collect a bunch of action figures of the godzilla stuff and apparently when i was really young i had an argument with someone at a comic book store that sold those things about a name of one of them and i was right oh uh. like five <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> but uh that's cool. alien, a- aliens and ufos and aside were there any other myths and urban legends you heard about in nova scotia when you were a kid oh there's so many you know uh being from nova scotia like even the like five o'clock news that we had um had a section called bill jessam's maritime mysteries and I thought, you know, that's something that maybe happened in every town and that was just the way the news was everywhere, but it would be like a 15 minute segment where he would like Bill Jessam would uh, dive into like a local like mystery, a ghost story or paranormal thing or a murder mystery and and uh, and that always like really stuck with me and like now I'm like very nostalgic for that and I just I, I I'm like obsessed with like collecting like you know ghost stories and mysteries from my hometown and I love going to any like like bookstore especially the ones off the beaten path and I'll just go like to the local section and try and find like the books that were like self-published by people who wanted to like um you know cherish their family's memories and sometimes you'll find like ghost stories or little mysteries in those and uh and I just find them I find them so fascinating. Um, gosh, there's like, there's, there's, there's so many of them, but the one that like stuck with me the most was the story of Shag Harbor and the, and the UFO crash that happened in 1967. And um, because like when I was a kid that like, I remember learning about that story, like around the same time I saw the trailer for Fire in the Sky and I started researching like alien stuff and then finding out there's a story of a UFO crash literally like in my home province. Um, And so, yeah, just, I I was like obsessed with like that story um, and finding like any like article or a little documentary uh, thing I could like on it. And and yeah, just like, it's always like stayed with me and I always thought like, I wanna use that like, you know, as inspiration for for a story someday, someday to tell. Um, so a mare or Mara is the Germanic and Slavic names for a malicious entity in folklore that rides or presses on a person's chest while they sleep, striking mm. terror in the ind- individual and a feeling of suffocation. This phenomenon has as many names as there are cultures around the world. The Pisadire in Brazil, 
Amatadori in Sardinia, Jathum in Arab countries, Bong Day in Vietnam, Kam in Tibet, in Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and parts of America, the creature is called the Night Hag or Old Hag. Yeah. Whatever whatever the name, the belief of, in this creature is Proto-Indo-European, which is to say it predates all modern language to around 4500 BC. It was a Wednesday. Today, the old hag phenomenon is thought to be caused by sleep paralysis. Have you had any experiences with sleep paralysis? And why do you suppose a female shadow or demon is the shared experience among those who suffer from it? Oh, gosh. Yes, I, I do. Uh, I used to a lot. And growing up, I remember when I was young, I would, um, like the first times that it happened to me, I still remember it very vividly um and it terrified me like i i remember um i used to share a bedroom with my younger brother and my brother and my dad were away one weekend and i woke up in the middle of the night and i looked over and there was a figure laying in my brother's bed and i re quickly realized it was not my brother and it was, <laughs> it was a dark figure and it started just like whispering like really fast like all this like crazy stuff to me and I remember being so terrified. I was like, I thought I was so scared I couldn't move because I wanted to jump like out of my bed. And I couldn't. And I eventually was able to scream uh, for my mom. And then she came running into the room and that figure was gone. And she brought me to her bedroom. And I remember I laid in her bed and then she ran back out into the hallway, probably thinking like I saw someone break into the house or something. And as soon as she left the threshold of the doorway, the figure just like stood like back into the, and like I just saw its silhouette like in the doorway there. And it continued like talking to me really fast. And, uh, and I screamed for my mom again and she came back into the room and the figure stepped aside like before she came back. And um, I, she took me to the doctors like the next day. And I remember the doctors like asked me to like draw what I saw. And I remember thinking as a kid, like, oh, that's kind of weird. Um, and then never really got an answer. Like never, you know, knew what that was and it would happen every once in a while. And I just would kind of keep it to myself until I was in college. And we were making a short film about a ghost and I was talking to a teacher and I, I told him that story and he uh, told me like, oh, maybe that, you know, it was like the hag. And I was like, what's the hag? And he was like, you should look it up online. And I did, I went home and I looked it up and I was like just shocked, you know, that there were millions of other people that experienced something similar and I had no idea. And then I saw uh, Rodney Asher's documentary, The Nightmare, uh, which talks about sleep paralysis. And um, I saw it at the Chattanooga like film festival. And I literally like was crying like through the screening because I was hearing people explain to explain a similar very similar situations and like i felt like finally like i was hearing from people who were experiencing what i was experiencing and uh i guess it maybe it probably made me feel like i wasn't alone in that but yeah i've had some like crazy like it hasn't happened in a while like the last time it happened was probably like three years ago and I was back home and I was lying in bed. And then all of a sudden I saw the figure like standing in the doorway and it ran and jumped on top of me and it pinned me like up against the wall. And uh, I realized in the moment what was happening. And I knew it was because, you know, I'd seen the documentary now. And so I just focused on like what that was and that like, you know, I knew what was happening and this was a sleep paralysis moment and I just kind of fought my way out of it. And I think I like wiggled my toes because someone told me that was a way to kind of get out of it. <laughs> and uh, eventually I did. And so it hasn't really happened. So it may, almost makes me kind of think like, is there like something more to it? Was it is, like now that like I developed maybe uh, 
not having a fear for it that it hasn't you know attacked me since so it was yeah. It, uh, it wasn't like similar to like those moments in movies where they just like talk to themselves saying it's not real over and over again. That kind, kind of, of maybe that's kind of what honestly that's yeah that's what it was like. Like I remember literally with my head like pinned to the wall, being yeah. like, "This isn't real. This isn't real." Like, just calm down. You'll get through it. And I did, and then it was gone. You know. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's creepy. Multiple yeah. occasions you telling that story, my hair stood on end. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I swear. Like, um, yeah, it, it's ha it's happened like a, a bunch of times. There was, I'll tell one other crazy moment. Um, but I don't know if it was sleep paralysis or it was just a ghost. But when I was making my first film, Hobo with a Shotgun, I was brought to Toronto and put up in this hotel. And I was there for like, I don't know, like two or three weeks. And I was in the room by myself. And one night I woke up to like blood curdling screams, like in my room. Like it was like someone was in my room, a woman screaming like bloody murder. And I thought I woke up and I was like, oh, this must be sleep paralysis, you know, like, but I was able to get up. Normally I'm like frozen and I can't move and I got up and I was walking all around the apartment and uh and I couldn't find the source of the screaming and literally you know, literally the only time in my life that I've ever take went back to bed and put a pillow over my ears was then and I just drowned tried to drown out the screaming and just went back to sleep thinking this must have been a sleep paralysis thing and so I go to the studio the next morning and and with the sound guys were doing sound on the movie and I'm telling them the story of what happened. And my producer, Nee Fitchman, looked at me like white as a ghost. And he was like, Jason, I kid you not, we put a filmmaker up in the same place about a month ago and the exact same thing happened to him. He's like, I'll get you out of there right now if you want to get out of there. And I was like, no, 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 it's cool. It should, you know, it should be fine. And it never happened again, but it was, pretty, it was pretty creepy that no just, ah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's terrible oh yeah my gosh. it was that was crazy like i don't know how to explain that i'm surprised i didn't find that story in my research wow <laughs> <laughs> um i've got a few ghost stories uh so i guess I'm, they're probably not all out there <laughs> Um, so around your seventh and eighth grade years, you and your friends found skateboarding. You mm. held a job in the eighth grade to save money to buy a video camera. You began filming skateboarding, then skits, followed by shorts. What motivated you to save for a camera? Do any of these early films still exist? And where could someone watch your remake of Beetlejuice? Oh, gosh. Yeah, Beetlejuice I made when I was eight years old. And that was like the first time... Like, I love Beetlejuice, like, so much when I was a kid, and I just, I didn't even know what films were. I knew my dad had a camera that he had for work, and maybe, like, I don't know, I just thought, like, oh, you could film me being, like, Beetlejuice, and I don't know where the hell that footage is or if it even exists, uh, but I, I'd love to find it someday. But, um, yeah, I, like, I, uh, I work, like, like in construction and summer jobs so I could save up and buy a camera and at first it was just to film me and my friend skateboarding and uh my best friend uh Jermaine Arsenault uh I got him into skateboarding and he got me into horror movies and uh my parents had a shed in their backyard and we turned it into like a clubhouse and we built bunks in it and we would go down to my video store in my neighborhood and we would rent, we rent in one summer, we rented every horror movie and action movie, sci-fi film. And we watched basically the whole collection from the video store. And we would like, almost like every other day, they had a deal that was five for five for five, five movies for $5 for five days. And we were just like every night watching like three or four movies after skateboarding. And so I started becoming obsessed with the horror movies and Jermaine, my buddy was becoming obsessed with skateboarding. 
And, uh, and so we like, anytime we weren't skateboarding, I was trying to get them to make little horror movies with me. And, uh, some of those are on tape somewhere. Um, there's going to be a making of, of kids versus aliens that will be on the, the Blu-ray and that shows a bunch of clips from like our childhood movies. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I should get those. I should get, I should get them up there, get them online someday. Um, Many kids are first introduced to horror through fairy tales and children's stories like Billy Goat's Gruff or the Juniper Tree. Was there a children's story or fairy tale that scared or excited you the most as a child? Oh, that's a good question. There was this like um, retelling of Hansel and Gretel called like Chicken Legs or something. <laughs> uh, but the story of Hansel and Gretel was definitely... Uh, one that really like freaked me out as a kid um you had a catholic up upbringing and i read the first mm -hmm. horror movie you saw was the original uh, you just said that wait in my notes you just said that uh that <laughs> your the first horror movie you saw was the original king kong yeah uh, with your grandfather uh yeah. was it your like i know your friend really introduced you to horror but was mm -hmm. it your grandfather who seriously like who first introduced you to horror and yeah, just, like that mm -hmm. he did with kind of like by accident by mm -hmm. King Kong just being on TV and you know that in that really like intrigued me as a kid and then also uh, I saw I remember Jaws uh really had a huge effect on me as well too but Jaws I didn't when I saw it I was obsessed with it but I was more obsessed with the idea of studying sharks. It got me like really into sharks and I I before I was a filmmaker I thought maybe I would be like a marine biologist. Um, and then um, and then it was that summer with my friends skateboarding and watching horror movies that like, like because I had the camera in my hand and I remember seeing Evil Dead 2 and the way the camera moves in Evil Dead 2 is just so uh, interesting to me. And it, it made me, I don't know, maybe it was because the camera is like moving a lot and then with me on my skateboard filming uh, my friends, I'm moving a lot with my camera. And I remember like wanting to try and replicate like the camera moves of Evil Dead 2. Um, and uh, that really kind of being the thing that got me to film narrative stuff. And, uh, and yeah, that was like just such a huge, huge inspiration. Um. Did your parents have any restrictions on what you were able to watch when you were a kid? Yeah, like a, a bit, yeah. Because uh, of the, you know, Catholic upbringing as well, too. Uh, <laughs> like, I wasn't allowed to watch a lot of horror movies. Um, but I would uh, go over to my best friend, uh, John Davies, who uh, co-wrote uh, Hobo with a Shotgun and Kids vs. Aliens and the anthology shorts. Um, I would go to his house and his mom... I uh, would let us watch like some horror movies and like movies like Conan the Barbarian and Terminator and and uh, those were had a big impact as well too. Uh, but it was I think it was partly because I wasn't allowed to watch horror movies as a young kid that made it also kind of interesting to me as well too. Like I was really terrified of Freddy Krueger and I would watch I would see the trailers on TV for Nightmare on Elm Street and be like terrified of him and i remember when i was in the sixth or when i was in uh, grade one there was a kid in the sixth grade who came to school dressed as freddie and he like chased all the kids in the playground at recess and i remember running from him thinking it was actually freddy krueger that was uh that was chasing me and my friends and so i was so scared of him and and not allowed to watch the movies um, you know, again, me wanting to try and see it. So, you know, to kind of confront my fear or know a little bit more about it, but I wasn't allowed to watch the movie, the Nightmare on Elm Street films. And then one night, late one night, Nightmare on Elm Street 4 came on TV. And in the opening, you see like a dog, like taking a piss in the junkyard and it shoots out fire and it cracks the earth and Freddy like comes out, you know, from hell. And I just remember thinking it was so funny uh, that I couldn't believe, like I was scared of this character. Like it was so over the top and kind of, by the time Nightmare on Elm Street 4 came around, it's like pretty, 
you know, cartoony by that point. It's still awesome. I love that movie. But um, had I had just seen that movie years prior, it would have saved me many countless nights, that's for sure, or sleepless nights, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so you continued filming in your high school years, and you've said you sh- skateboarded with your friends, you would hang out at, at that clubhouse, watch watch uh, movies with your friend, uh, and you would probably hang out at Penhorn Mall and watch movies. Oh, yes. Uh, I read you were you would scour pawn shops after lo- school looking for 70s and 80s exploitation films on VHS. Mm-hmm. Having grown up around the ocean, you were, as you said, originally interested in becoming an, a marine biologist before yep. a filmmaker. I believe you had a job selling comics, action figures, and video games at the last game store for the owner, Adam Perry and continue to work there through college i heard you say you had a hard time academically what were you like in high school and who was brian o'grady oh my gosh that's amazing you're like the nardwar of movies (laughs) um he like uh so brian o'grady was my high school film and video teacher and also probably one of the most influential people ever in my life. And unfortunately, he's no longer around anymore. Uh, he passed a few years ago. Um, but um, like uh, you said, like I was, I struggled in school. Um, and when I had a camera, I tried to, con- I tried to convince and was lucky enough to pretty much convince every teacher to allow me to turn my projects into like film videos and film projects. And that really helped me like get through school, uh, grade 10 and 11. And by the time I got to the 12th grade, the high school had seen me and my friends like running around with a video camera. And so they actually developed a film and video program for us by the time we got to the 12th grade. And they had the art teacher of the school, Brian O'Grady, you know, spearhead this film program uh, but he didn't know much about film production necessarily, but he was so encouraging about us like making the things that we were like passionate about. Like, I remember like kids like in his cl- in his art class trying to they would draw like offensive stuff just to get a rise out of him and like piss him off or get get kicked out of the class like on purpose. Oh, yeah, there he is. Wow. It's amazing. Oh, my God. Wow. That's so cool. That's Brian. And oh man, he was just, he was so sweet. And just looking at him now just brings such a, a a warm heart, a warm feeling to me. Cause he like, he, uh, he like, he, I would see kids like, you know, try to offend him. And then he would find like the great stuff like in their art mm-hmm. and like tell them like, you know, what was great about the, piece that they just made and I would watch him leave a student's desk with them, you know, uh, feeling a different type of way, you know, that they were um, almost inspired now, you know, they tried to offend him and he left them inspired and, and he never like tried to like get in between like, he never tried to push his own artistic um, sensibilities on us rather he would try to get in our heads and find the things that we would be inspired by. Like, I remember he like found like the short films that Robert Rodriguez made when he was young and he would show us those movies, those shorts in a way to kind of, to inspire us to show like, this is where this filmmaker started. And, you know, now at that point he had already made like from Dust Till Dawn and Desperado and movies that like I really loved. And so he was showing us that like, it's possible. And, and he would, every off class every day after school i would i would go to his class and he would take his own personal time to help me learn how to edit like at at that point i was editing from vh like a v a vcr to a vcr <laughs> and then um the apple computers came out with like imovie and so he showed me like how to use imovie and then he helped me apply to a community college to to learn more about film, like when I graduated high school. And so, yeah, he was, uh, he was amazing. And I still think about him like all the time. And whenever I get to, you know, speak for students at a school, I'm always thinking about him. And like, I just want to like, you know, try and do what he did for me, you know? 
Yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, also, I when I was I was really I've been growing up in the movie business, and uh, I actually was making really like like dumb films when I was really young. That's like, awesome. I, I edited with iMovie. Oh, that's funny cool. Enough. Yeah, funny yeah, enough, I like, edited with that. <laughs> Yeah, it was like, it was so easy and just like a great way to learn how to like, you know, cut images and music together. Uh, gosh, yeah, I learned so much using <laughs> iMovie. <laughs> um, so in an age where kids are dealing with bullies, COVID lockdowns and active shooter drills, do you think horror movies can provide the catharsis for teenagers trying to pr process these real life fears? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Um like I you know the world's a different place than what it was when I was growing up but it definitely worked that way for me you know um and like I think I think there it could it can definitely be the same way for for kids today I, w I would at least hope so um so after high school you enrolled in a two-year film program at Nova Scotia Community College this is mm -hmm. where you learned how to use cameras lights sound gear and how to edit uh were your parents supportive of your decision to become a filmmaker yeah they were like they were always supportive of me wanting like of like of all me and my siblings like to do what we dreamed of doing and chase up like my dad was a big you always preach that like if you do like what you love then you won't feel like working you know and he always said that and uh but he had me working since from a young age like he started putting like i would work every summer since i was like 12 years old like working in trenches and digging ditches and stuff <laughs> for him but he wanted he really wanted to instill like a good worth ethic and he always told me he's like this is because I want you to chase after what you want to do. Now, I don't think they ever thought that I would chase after, <laughs> you know, the film industry and like no one in my family has ever done anything in the in the arts. You know, it, it, my family were farmers and construction workers. And so I think like that scared them mostly because they didn't know how to like help me, you know, get get into those into that industry. And um, but they were still super supportive and i uh i you know went to screen arts which was a two-year uh program and it it cost like it was so cheap i think i paid like fifteen hundred dollars like a a year to go and you know just taking gear out for one weekend at the school more than made up for the tuition that i had to pay and I definitely exploited the school, that's for sure. <laughs> and if you were to talk to them now, they'd be like, oh, yeah, we remember. We used to have to clean blood off all the gear every time he brought it back. And um, But that my years there were amazing. And I had another amazing teacher there named Janet Hawkwood, who uh, was like, she was tough. Like, I remember, like, the first day of class, she asked everyone, she was like, all right, who doesn't have their license, their driver's license? And then everyone who raised their hand, she was like, all right, you're going to go and get your driver's license uh, and, and come back when you have your, you know, you've done the test. Uh, because in this industry, if you're going to start off, you're going to be doing a lot of driving. You're going to have to drive. You're going to have to drive gear. You're going to have to you know, do all this, you know, PA or anything, you're going to have to learn how to drive. <laughs> and so she weeded out the week, like very quickly. I think we started with like 30 something students. And I think I graduated with maybe like 10 or 11. But it was awesome, because like, the people who were super passionate about it, which you need to be. Um, and she knew that. Um, were the ones to make it through and those and still to this day though um, the people I graduated I work with them and uh, they work in the film industry and so uh, yeah that was a, a pretty pretty crazy experience uh, but uh, yeah I, I loved uh, <laughs> I loved my time at college and um, it was where I learned how to do everything they taught us how to you know work cameras sound uh, how to be a gaffer, a grip, assistant director, produce, you know, go through budgets, script supervising. And so by the time I got out of uh, community college, 
I was just off to the races and making my own films. Um, and I didn't, and I was, you know, camera operating, doing the sound, editing everything. I, you know, me and my best friend, John Davies, like, cause we went through the program together. And so at, once we were out of there, we were just making our own stuff. So you have an extensive, almost encyclopedic knowledge of 70s and 80s exploitation films. <laughs> I'd like to read you the synopsis of three movies to see if you can guess what they are. Is Ooh, that okay with you? Yeah, that sounds great. All right. So first, a Vietnam veteran and former prisoner of war vows revenge on a group of rednecks who stole his silver dollars and killed his family. Rolling Thunder. <laughs> Correct. Second, <laughs> an American girl tra transfers to a Swiss finishing school and uses psychic powers to communicate with insects to help a paralyzed entomologist stop a serial killer. Yeah, Jennifer Connelly in the Dario Argento movie Phenomena, which is <laughs> one, another one of my favorites. <laughs> um, third and final. A martial arts rock band goes up against a band of motorcycle ninjas who have tightened their grip on Florida's narcotics trade. Oh, another one of my favorite movies, My Miami Connection. <laughs> That's yes. again great. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, my my friends were the ones to like find uh, Miami Connection. Zach Carlson and Evan Husney, who I produced Dark Side of the Ring with. They, you know, basically unearthed Miami Connection. And at the time, I don't think the movie had a trailer or ever had a trailer. And so they asked me to cut the trailer for the movie. Um, and so they sent me the film and it blew my mind. Like, um, it's like, I can still say it's, it, 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 it landed into one of my top 10 favorite movies like of all time. It's just so charming and so fun. And uh, I was honored to be able to, to cut the trailer for that movie. So you made several short films out of college. There was a 60 minute zombie action thriller called Fist of Death, which played to a sold out crowd at the Oxford Theater. Do you prefer yeah. fast zombies or slow zombies? Oh, gosh. And well, at the time, I was very into slow zombies and I was a huge mark for George Romero. And uh, I loved his work and, and uh, I loved his portrayal of zombies. And so I was really into the idea of like slow zombies, but uh, the zombies in that movie uh, also fight as well too. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like martial arts action. Uh, it's funny, like I was just actually talking to my friends uh, about how we're now coming up on the, the 20 year anniversary of Fist to Death. <laughs> and um it's not out because we only made like a hundred copies like on dvd you know 20 years ago uh so it's not really out there but i still say to me it's my favorite movie like i ever made <laughs> <laughs> um so you also filmed the teeth beneath at your friend's skate shop for 300 dollars yeah 258 dollars in u.s dollars at the time <laughs> <laughs> You handled writing, directing, editing, lighting, and even and you even composed the score. The film sold out its premiere at the Atlantic Film Festival, and Coast Magazine awarded it Best Local Film. Is mm. there anything you can tell me about your unfinished film from this time called Streets of Domination? Oh, yes. Yeah. So after we made The, the Teeth Beneath, um, uh, we jumped into making another film like um, the you know, we wanted to make another like feature action movie. And so I got like all my friends together and we spent like over a summer uh, shooting it. And, and then I think like into like fall as well too. Um, we spent a lot of time shooting that movie and we shot the whole thing. Um, it just never got finished. It was like, I think probably because it was such a hard, it was such a crazy hard movie to like make and uh and what, i think around that time too the 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 trailer contest for uh grindhouse uh came around and so we kind of just shifted gears into making that trailer and then once we made that trailer it took off and um i was into the races of trying to develop that movie into a feature so i don't know maybe someday i'll go back and i'll finish uh streets of domination maybe for the 20th 
anniversary of when we shot that and uh because it is an it's an epic like no budget you know backyard <laughs> action movie and i do love those from like other filmmakers and you know we risked our lives there's like we risked our lives like making that film so um i you know i owe it to everyone eventually to to get that thing finished <laughs> Uh, in 2007, ain't it cool news advertised as you as you just mentioned, Grindhouse tra- the Grindhouse Trailer Contest, sponsored by the South by Southwest Film Festival and Robert Rodriguez, along mm-hmm. with your frequent frequent collaborators Rob Cotterill and John Davies, you went to work. You wrote a script, picked up and picked up a camera, and shot a trailer titled "Hobo with a Shotgun," with $150 over six days and in 30 degree temperatures. A month after the trailer went viral on YouTube, it won the contest. Inspiration for "Hobo" struck while, while spitballing film ideas at at a local hometown hangout called Ronnie's Pizza on Main Street. You gifted them hobo, a hobo with a shotgun poster, but I heard it was lost during recent re- renovations. What's the story behind Hobo with a Shotgun? Yeah, so um, like you said, like uh, the contest was announced on Ain't a Cool News and um, I was at Ronnie's Pizza, the pizza shop that we've always been going to since we were kids. And I was sitting there with John Davies and uh, my other friend, uh, Mojo Widgery, AKA Joseph Widgery. And um, John had told me about the trailer contest. And at the time we were thinking about entering a contest that Steven Spielberg had uh, for a show that I think was called On the Lot maybe. Um, So we were thinking about that. And then when he told us there was this trailer contest for you know, to make like a fake trailer for a movie that was like inspired by like 70s and 80s exploitation films. That just felt like, you know, that's where our heads were at, like at that time. So literally like we looked outside Ronnie's Pizza and it was just like on Main Street Dartmouth. And at that time it was like, there's a pawn shop next door. There's a strip club across the street. (laughs) There's just like all the graffiti like everywhere. And we just started kind of envisioning almost like a like a like a spaghetti western exploitation film like happening in like this post-apocalyptic uh like world like the kind of like the 70s like or the 80s like italian post-apocalyptic films that we like and i think like literally the next day we went out and we shot like a night's worth of material uh it never made it into our trailer but it just got us to like pull the trigger and just get out with our friends and start shooting it because we only had like two weeks. I think it was to like shoot it, edit it, make our own music for it and submit it. And so we submitted it and uh, I got a phone call that was like asking me if I was going to be in South by Southwest. And I was like, oh, I wasn't planning on going and uh, I never really been to a film festival outside my hometown. And uh they were like, well, we think like you should come, you know, your, your film, your short is one of the top three, you know, selected. And I was just blown away. <laughs> uh, cool. I was so <laughs> excited. And then, uh, and then they brought us to South by and there was like a panel with uh, Rob Rodriguez and Harry Knowles. And they were talking about Grindhouse, the movie, because, you know, these trailers were to help promote the Grindhouse film. And they had like a little like Q&A and then they played the top three trailers and they announced Hobo with with a shotgun as the winner. And uh, I was just so shocked. Um, And uh, and then they like they invited us to like come go see Troublemaker Studios, which was it was a ridiculous there's a whole ridiculous story behind that. But uh, we uh, I, I remember it was like we got invited to come to LA to go to the premiere of Grindhouse, um, which was cool. And I'd never been to LA before. It was my first time going. And my producing partner, Rob Cotterell, he had just been an assistant director on Stuart Gordon's uh, movie, Stuck. And uh, Stuart Gordon, who did, you know, The Reanimator and From Beyond and Dolls, all these, you know, amazing films. Uh, he put us up in his house and uh, it was like 
so he was he was like the best he was so amazing he like i remember like you know i'm a kid from dartmouth first time coming to hollywood going to stay at one of my you know uh heroes like homes you know one of the masters of horror and i'm thinking like man this is gonna be crazy like what's his house gonna be like you know and i we get to his house and it's just like the most normal like there's not a there's no horror paraphernalia anywhere you know you would never know that this guy even like <laughs> made movies really um and uh and like every morning he would like wake up and make us breakfast and coffee and and then he took us all he gave us a tour of like hollywood and like it was just so amazing we brought him to the grindhouse premiere and uh and that was yeah it was a, it was a it was a, an amazing experience and then like the day after we got a call from the canadian distributor of grindhouse and they were like yeah we're gonna attach your you know your short little fake trailer to the actual film prints of grindhouse in canada mm -hmm. and so they made like a bunch of film prints off my little short that i shot with you know a little handy cam on mini dv and uh for like literally like 150 bucks and it was attached to the movie and people thought it was like literally part of grindhouse you know <laughs> <laughs> um and they also the the distributor also expressed that they were interested in making the movie like turning the short into a full feature and then they introduced us to a producer in Canada named Nee Fitchman who uh was a, a ma another amazing person in my life who really believed in us and uh, he's the one that really helped us get uh Hobo with a Shotgun turned into a feature movie i was gonna i was gonna ask what all the prizes were for the the contest but you just told me them um, yeah there, so... there wasn't there wasn't really like a prize necessarily i think there was like some like laptop or something maybe like but it was it was no good i mean <laughs> yeah. i mean all that <laughs> yeah well like, that's a little it, more of a it, prize. it became a stepping you know like a, a another stepping stone in my life and career like because people you know that trailer took off that was really able to get my foot in the door uh to you know to try and yeah. climb up i also heard that stuart gordon introduced you to quentin tarantino yes he did yes that was <laughs> awesome i like uh I yeah like because like if there wasn't any like sort of like there was no one to be like uh just you know it was literally like here's a ticket go you know go to grindhouse you know or <laughs> whatever and uh so Stuart like really made it special like for us you know and uh and so he like because like you know no one from the the contest or anything was going to be introducing us to Robert Rodriguez or Quentin Tarantino or anything like that so uh, it was so awesome for Stuart to like, he was like, you want to meet Quentin? And I was like, yeah, sure. That'd be great. He was like, come with me. And he, he came over, he brought us over to Quentin Tarantino and Quentin had a lot of respect for Stuart. Uh, so he, <laughs> you know, was gracious to us, which was cool. Um, so just really quickly, you've already said most of this, but uh, you received a call while walking through the front gates of Universal Studios. That's it's right. Films saying they'll distribute your, your trailer with the release of Ground into House, and they wanted to make Hobo with a Shotgun as a film. Now you're off making that feature film debut, but not so fast. <laughs> you missed something complete. You missed a complete thing. Mm -hmm. It takes another two years before Hobo would begin. In that time, yeah. you're editing and directing shows for the Discovery Channel. You decide yes. to put up $5,000 your, of your own money and you make Treevenge, a short about Christmas trees taking revenge or taking Treevenge <laughs> yep. on the people who kill them each holiday season. It's nominated <laughs> for Best Short Film at Sundance and gets a shout out from Kevin Smith. <laughs> well, That's right, with, I forgot about that. With all of its momentum, why did Hobo take two years to get started? And do you think it could have stalled permanently if you hadn't made Treevenge? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the Hobo with a Shotgun was made within like the Canadian system of making movies. 
and uh, there's a Canadian funding body called Telefilm, and it had been a very long time since they've been involved with like a genre film, you know, and, and back in the day, they call it the tax shelter days in Canada, when we had this like influx of all these amazing genre movies that were made in Canada, and then once the tax credit uh, was cut off, like that was all kind of like shut down. And so, uh, there just wasn't, you know, they just weren't into making genre movies. And here we are banging on their door constantly trying to get them to finance our, our movie. <laughs> and the, you know, the script for Hobo with a Shotgun was really crazy. And, uh, there were people who didn't want that movie to get made. Uh, and, um, you know, with having the Fitchman, you know, on board, he, it's, he just, he won't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, just having him a part of our team really gave us like, you know, uh, I guess like the, you know, some, some clout with the Canadian financing financers, but we made uh, that short film Treevenge uh, while we were developing Hobo with a Shotgun. And, you know, again, I didn't really think like it would go anywhere, you know, outside my hometown, but I just like my producing partner really wanted to also create an exercise for me to make a movie where I'm not doing everything like on the film, you know, he wanted me to work with a, a cinematographer and a camera operator and, you know, ha you know, have someone make costumes and you know, to create like a, a an environment that is closer to what actual you know films with a budget and a and a, uh, a team are like, and so we made Treevenge, and then that took off at film festivals, and and uh, it got submitted to Sundance, and I'll never forget when I found out that it got into Sundance. Uh, I was in a grocery store and uh, I got the call like right before Christmas and I literally like dropped everything and like ran outside and I was just like <laughs> so excited and uh, that did and then it got nominated for best short film there and we just had such an amazing time at Sundance with the movie and and uh, when we came back from Neve was smart in that on our way back from Sundance, he held a screening in Toronto with everyone from Telefilm mm -hmm. and all the financers that we really wanted to support our feature film. And he showed them the Treevenge. And, and then that really is what helped, you know, get everyone on board to be like, okay, this kid can do more than just a, you know, a two minute trailer. Like, let's mm -hmm. give him a, let's give him a shot. Um, so really quickly, we're actually 50 minutes into the interview, and oh, I'm, cool. and I'm only halfway into the question. So I guess that's it, cool. I'm good. It will go over. <laughs> Thank yeah, you so no, much. that's okay. Thank you so much. Um, so you make Hobo with a shotgun in your yeah. hometown, and then an icon <laughs> as your as your lead with the late great Rutger Hauer. Yeah. Was Nick Nolte ever considered to play the hobo? Oh gosh, yes, <laughs> he was because. Um, they, uh, the Canadian distributors want created an exercise for me. They were like, create a list of your, the top actors you would think, you know, could play the role. And, uh, I thought it was ridiculous. And, uh, I never, I thought there's no way we're ever going to get, you know, a famous actor or anything like that to be in this movie. So I kind of wrote the list in a way to like self sabotage it thinking that we'll just scratch these names off super quick and then we'll get to someone that, you know, is um, within our means. And so I put Nick Nolte at the top thinking there's no way in hell that's going to happen. And then they called me one day and they're like, can you be in LA tomorrow to meet Nick Nolte? And so I was like, yeah, sure. But I was also a little hesitant because like I read the stories about like Ang Lee like working with him on the Hulk and that like Ang Lee, like, or uh, uh, Nick, like, you know, requested that Ang Lee give him some of his blood so that they could like look under, look at it under like a telescope or something or like that. It was something that he would ask of his filmmakers or something. I don't know if that was real, but that's what was going around at the time. And I was so 
terrified of that and like just giving blood or you know getting blood out of me is a is a task onto itself and so uh so but i went to la and uh the instructions were like he's just gonna leave the front gate open for you and you just go into the backyard and search for him and uh i was like okay sure like (laughs) whatever it takes and the meeting kept getting pushed and pushed until like they were like can you go there at like 4 a.m and i was like yeah sure like whatever it takes and then it just kept getting pushed and it never happened and so i was just sent back home and we scratched nick off the list and which i was fine to do and and then uh then they they reached out to rugger hauer and his agent read the script and hated it and thought you know, <laughs> it wasn't good for him and so i thought okay well then that's over but then rugger wanted to meet me and talk to me and so I think it was the first Skype call I ever got on and it was two weeks before going into production oh and God. they were telling me if I didn't get him to agree to do the film that they were going to have to push the shoot and you know if you push a movie a lot of times that can be like the death nail of the film and so I was so scared I was so nervous and I get on the call with Rugger and he's like this with like a cigarette it's like looking at the monitor you know and i'm like oh gosh so i just like got up like this and i just looked into the camera and <laughs> and we talked about the movie for like maybe five minutes or so and i knew he was an ocean conservationist and like i said before like i grew up wanting to be a marine biologist and so i just started talking about my love of the ocean and and then for 45 minutes, that's what we were talking about. We were talking about the ocean and I had done all this work with the uh, National Geographic and Discovery um, um, just right before that and had worked with some people that he also knew as well too within uh, the ocean conservation world. And um, and so we just like hit it off. And so he went from like this to like right up like this as well too. And, <laughs> and we were laughing and at the end of the conversation, I was like, man, this is so great. Like meeting you, like I, I'm just having so much fun. And, and, uh, he, he was like me too. And, and then we said goodbye. And then my producer, Rob and, and my, uh, DP Kareem Hussein, they're hanging out behind the door and they burst <laughs> in as soon as the call is over. And they're like, did he say yes? Did he say yes? And I was like, I, I, I don't know. I didn't even ask him. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, He had called back production like 30 minutes later and said that he was going to do the film and everyone was so excited and and uh yeah and then he he came to Nova Scotia and it was the craziest uh few weeks of my life (laughs) (laughs) so hobo with the shotgun moves fast and is full of saturated colors it's an amped up mix of hong kong splatter 70s grindhouse and 80s retro feature futuristic revenge cranked to 11 one reviewer said it pushes every button it can find and then pounds them into the panel then smashes the panel with a wrecking ball rutger hauer called the style graffiti western yeah on the first day rutger was pulling practical jokes on the last day he said he knew he had to make the movie as soon as he met you is there a story you can share about rutger other than the one before oh my gosh there's so many. I don't know like <laughs> how to pick just one. Gosh. Oh man, like there's so much to him. Like he was so sensitive and he had a huge heart and he was also very mischievous as well too and he liked to try and you know see what he could get away with and uh, <laughs> uh Gosh, like um, one of my favorite stories is uh, it was on the la- like after we finished shooting, Neve Fitchman, uh, the, uh, the producer I was talking about, he wanted to take us all to like a really nice dinner. Um, and we went to this really nice restaurant in Halifax called the Press Gang. And we have this beautiful dinner. We're celebrating, you know, just having wrapped the movie. And uh, Rugger's sitting there and he's like, he's like, do you think I could smoke a cigarette in here? And <laughs> we're like, no, there's absolutely no way you can smoke a cigarette in this restaurant. He's like, really? Like, you think they'll kick me out? 
And I was like, yeah, they'll kick you out. And he's like, well, how long do you think it'll take for them to, to do that? And uh, my line producer was like, oh, like five seconds, at least five seconds. And so Roger just like leans it, puts a cigarette in his mouth and he leans into the candle and he lights it. And the line producer goes three or uh, five, four, three. And then you hear a cook in the kitchen scream like, is someone smoking? Is someone <laughs> smoking in here? And, uh, and then literally like five waiters like rush our table and they're like, sir, <laughs> sir. You can't be you can't smoke in here you gotta go outside you gotta go outside and he's like okay 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 and he gets up and he just slowly like gets up and just keeps smoking a cigarette as he's like walking out of the restaurant <laughs> and uh we go outside to meet him and uh the guy who played the original hobo in the trailer mm -hmm. his name's david brunt uh he was someone who i worked or i met he was a customer that would come into that comic book video game store that I worked at and I put him in the short because he was such an interesting funny character but he had never acted before in his life and so when it came time to do the feature film we realized it wouldn't be able to work with him but I still had him like come on set and be with me like every single day and work with Rugger and Rugger you know um, was very inspired by David Brunt you know for the performance of the hobo in the movie and so like when we walk out of the restaurant afterwards, Rugger takes his cigarette pack and he gives it to Dave and he's like, I want you to have this. And uh, Dave opened it and it was like, gosh, like six or seven thousand dollars in cash, like all the money that production gave Rugger for his like meals, they call it per diem, um, like all for all his meals while he was there in Nova Scotia. He just like gave it all to Dave Brunt and it was, that was just so nice. So it's like the extreme of like, you know, getting kicked out of this restaurant for him like smoking <laughs> to him doing like the sweetest thing like ever. Uh, gosh, I just, I love them and miss them so much. So um, blood flows plenty in this movie, um, but you've also said that you get squeamish when people draw when you get drawn on blood. Yeah. Uh, how, did, how in the world does that work? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think like uh, like yeah, I, I am so squeamish when it comes to the real thing. Like, <laughs> gosh, when we filmed Fist of Death, like mm -hmm. um, there was a chainsaw scene. And the chainsaw, like we used a real chainsaw and, oh and it wasn't God. on, but it dropped on my hand and one of the blades like went into my hand. There's still like a scar here. Oh. And uh, and I nearly fainted. Like, <laughs> see, like I just went pale and like everyone thought I was going to faint and I thought I was going to faint too. But it wasn't that bad. It was really just like a like a little piece that came out or whatever. Uh, but I think, you know, why maybe I get a little crazy with you know the gore effects in my movies is because i'm kind of like i don't know maybe taking the you know just having fun with it you know like whereas if it was like real or like more realistic it'd probably be you know harder for me to deal with but i think that's why my stuff is usually pretty over the top <laughs> Um, how did you wind up using the song Run With Us from the Canadian cartoon series The Raccoons at the end of Hobo? Yeah, well, um, you know, I had a lot of battles with the ending and trying, like a lot of people thought the movie needed to end on a happy, positive note. And I was just very adamant that I wanted it to end when like, like, because I saw Rugger as like, he's like a grizzly bear in this circus. And so I felt like when the grizzly bear gets shot, you know, at the end of the movie, it's like, that's the end of the film. Like I wanted to end from there. And so, but I still wanted, I didn't want people to like, you know, necessarily leave the theater being like, oh, you know, we just saw the hero like die and it's so, you know, dark and uh, <laughs> despairing. Um, so I like, I can't remember exactly how I like, what the initial thought was. I always loved that Lisa Lowheed song from Run With Us. And I wanted to do something that like, you know, I like showing uh, my Canadian roots like in my work as well too. And so I wanted to use something Canadian, but also something pumping and get you pumped up. 
and like the lyrics are like you know are very it's like a calling you know it's like run with us and like i just felt like that was kind of like the spirit of like the movie as well too and and so it worked like kind of like once the people who were trying to argue with me that we needed a positive ending once they saw how that song worked as the credits was rolling up it like it it just got you pumped up again you know it didn't make you feel you know sad necessarily yeah um so you directed the why is for young buck segment in the horror anthology the abcs of death in 2012 you in 2020 uh, 20 oh my goodness in 2013 you your final segment uh slumber party alien abduction for vhs2 is praised by fans and critics alike and is the precursor to kids versus aliens Uh, that one that one (laughs) yeah um where did the idea idea come from to film the segment from a dog's point of view and how how was that executed yeah well at the time when um when i was asked to pitch ideas for vhs2 i was really into uh like animal perspective movies uh <laughs> like i love like the babe films and uh love benji and this movie called Le Bear, which is a, a French film about a baby bear. And um, and so I was like, I was really inspired by those. And I was also really inspired by ride films and like ride films were like, uh, like at Universal Studios, they used to have this ride for Back to the Future where there was like a spherical screen that played you know, like a movie and you're in the Back to the Future car and the car moves with like the movements of the screen as well too and it makes you feel like you're in the movie um and Stuart Gordon did one for aliens as well too that's awesome that was like probably the bigger inspiration (laughs) because in that you're just like you're in the point of view of the tank going through uh one of the colonies on the planet that had been overtaken by aliens and um and so yeah i wanted to do animal perspective i wanted to create something that felt like a ride and uh so and then i thought of the idea like what's if there was like aliens that attacked a family home but it's all told from the perspective of their pet you know you never really get to see that and uh and so i pitched that they love that idea and then so i used my real like my our family dog riley (laughs) who had never acted before you know (laughs) He knew one trick, which was he could ride a skateboard, which was really cool. And uh, (laughs) skateboard dog. Yeah. And then uh, so like there's like the very opening shot of the short you see, it's like the dog and a garage door opens up in front of him and it's two kids in robot costumes. And it's hard to see, but they're actually dangling hot dogs from their (laughs) arms to, you know, to get the dog to come towards them for their shot with the camera on the back of the dog. And then every time the kids like drop their costumes, like after we did a take, my dog would run up and start eating the hot dog. <laughs> and like, we were like, I don't know, maybe like not even an hour into the first day of shooting. And you know, he's like this big and he <laughs> ate like five hot dogs. Like I can't even eat hot, five hot dogs. That's so bad. I know. <laughs> is your, is and so he like was just mom? like, what's that is your dog like a small dog or yeah he's like a little terrier oh uh, my goodness that yeah and so yeah like five hot dogs is like you know <laughs> that and he's like this big and so uh he managed to eat them and then so by the time you see him like the next shot i think is when he's trying to get on the skateboard <laughs> and like usually he would just like run and jump on the skateboard and go flying but you could see he's just so sluggish <laughs> you know he's just been you just filled with hot dogs and so I was like okay this can't work like I can't do this you know like um like every time we got to do a shot you know he's eating all the damn hot dogs so I got like I uh I took an elf doll like elf was this you know alien character from yeah. um like a I have an elf doll too, too. yeah oh I have sweet. An elf yeah doll. yeah yeah so I just I hollowed out the the elf doll and used it as a puppet and I stuck my hand inside it and put the camera like right here and, you know, right behind its head and its ears. And then I would just like get on all fours 
and I would run around uh, with this little elf puppet, and um, I think I think it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so in my research, I found you and I share a creative hobby. Um, this is from an ongoing project of mine. You can see there. Um, I'm doing, I call it fa- a face plant at Randy's Donuts. <laughs> uh, and then there's, and yes. you are at a premiere for Entourage. Yes, <laughs> um, the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> and then here's me at the Halloween house. Oh, I was just there literally the other day. <laughs> and then there's you at the, it's a little dark, but there's you at yes. the Playboy Mansion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That's so funny. So, I just, I like doing that in the most like obscure like <laughs> places. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, the Randy's Donuts was the, uh, the Randy's Donuts was the most, uh, nope, that's not it. Uh, <laughs> it's the most creative one of mine just that's so I love how awesome. i'm holding i'm holding the donut up so i fit so what we did was we grabbed a um a towel a little hand cloth and put it yeah. under my face so my face wasn't straight up on the gross cement yeah and i and my hair is long so it helped but um i went down there and i had the idea to just hold the bag in one hand and the donut up like i i just sacrificed everything else to save the donut yeah and then we also the guy who was there was just like yeah you can knock over a cone if you want to and so we did and it was just like i tripped over the cone Uh, that's great fun day (laughs) Yeah. Have you like got into, have you ever thought about doing filmmaking as well too? Yep. I'm going, I, again, I, I grow up, I grew up in, I, I am growing up in a uh, very heavily filmmaking, uh, very heavy filmmaking family. Oh, that's I, great. I'm someone who's special where I'm both a third generation filmmaker and a second generation. Oh my God. God, because my on my dad's side it's my grandmother, my dad, and then me, and then on my mom's side it's my mom and then me. Oh wow! So I'm bull, uh, it, it, it's really cool, and I really want to be a filmmaker. I specifically want to be a producer. The most. Yeah. Uh, wow. Also, yeah, me and my dad uh, have been coming up with uh, every once in a while a really good uh, idea for a film. Right now, we came up with a film that's basically kid uh realizes that they're always going to be on the naughty list so they kidnap santa and torture him (laughs) and we're we're gonna make it as like a trailer instead of an actual short film so the trailer similar to hobo with a shotgun and then i've also come up with a short film just for myself that's basically a kid um so my dad has the story from his childhood which is um when he watched, I think Friday the thirteenth, is that right? Friday the thirteenth. Um, he what he would do after that would was he would push doors all the way to the end so nobody so he could make sure nobody was hiding behind them. And yep. one day it stopped short. Oh and he got so and he just ran. And oh. it was apparently his brother's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so what I came up with was the, the, a kid watches Night of the Living Dead because that's free, fair use. Yeah, so you can use it. So uh, Night of the Living Dead, and after a while, it becomes a routine, and then it stops short. And this kid goes through this whole whole like runs down the stairs and uh, grabs a knife and does all and, and and like does all this stuff that's just a bunch of like. Uh, movie references there's one that's a scream reference where he's walking down a hall a hallway and in the dark uh back room the killer pops up and it's just his imagination (laughs) and and, uh and it ends with it's just the shoes yeah that's amazing that's great that's so fun yeah so i'm writing that currently and i also i like to write so oh that's awesome that's great and i love like you know, you you just you roll up on Randy's and stole a location. You know, like that's the like if you got that already, like and you're you're fearless in that way. That 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 goes a long way. You know, all the films I made growing up, like we just would go wherever we wanted to get the best shot. <laughs> yeah. Um. So 
continuing with the questions, you grew up watching Hulk Man, uh, Hulkamania, Macho mm-hmm. Man, Randy Savage, and Jake the Snake Roberts. You mm-hmm. built wrestling rings in your living room, constructed championship belts out of cardboard, and raided yeah. your parents' closets for costumes. In 2019, your docu series Dark Side of the Ring. Uh, right there <laughs> uh, premieres on Vice Television and examines uh, the most infamous incidents from wrestling history. It's a huge hit and has now spawned a second series with Dwayne The Rock Johnson whoa by the way called uh, <laughs> Tales from the Territories. If I name a big event in wrestling would you tell me what it, what its significance is? Um, it's, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> First, March 13th, 1997, WrestleMania 13 in Illinois at the Rosemont, uh, Rosemont Horizon. Uh, at the uh, Rosemont Horizon, goodness. Brad the Hitman Hart versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh, yeah. It's a great match. That's, um, yeah, people, that's, mm-hmm. a, that's a, a barn burner of a match for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, like what, what, what makes it that I'm, I have no idea about wrestling. <laughs> like, um, what makes it so special? That one, I believe if I'm right, is like, mm-hmm. is that the one, like, have you seen the match? I, th- I have not. Uh, okay. I, I almost the did, one I have not. <laughs> where, um, Steve Austin is like, he's like bleeding and Bret Hart has got him in the sharpshooter. And I think, oh, gosh, I hope I'm not wrong. Like, he's, like, like Stone Cold wouldn't give up. Like, he just, mm-hmm. you know, the sharpshooter is, like, the most painful submission ever. And, you know, Stone Cold just, like, wouldn't give up, like, at all. And, uh, I like, as a kid, like, Bret Hart was uh, one of my heroes, you know, him being Canadian from Calgary. Uh, the sharpshooter was, like, my favorite finishing move as a kid. And I used to do it. <laughs> to my siblings like all the time you know whenever they piss me off i'd put them in a structure <laughs> and uh a couple of years ago i should put it online a couple of years ago me and my brother made uh you know those like yule log videos where it's just like a fireplace you yeah. know just going yeah. for a long time we did that and where there's a fireplace but it's me uh putting my brother into a sharpshooter and he's screaming for like an hour while I'm just like wrenching on him in front of a fireplace. <laughs> um, uh, second, June 28th, 1998, King of the Ring at the, at the Civics Arena in Pittsburgh, Mankind versus The Undertaker, also called Hell in a Cell. What happened there? Oh, you got to watch it. Like once we're done this, you got to you gotta turn that on because that to me is the one of the greatest moments in entertainment history um it's uh you know if you believe in uh the crucifixion of jesus christ this is the modern day like version of it oh my goodness <laughs> and uh it was a, a a match between undertaker and mankind in a mm-hmm. giant cell like a, a cage that goes mm-hmm. around the ring and um there's an infamous moment where Undertaker uh, throws mankind off the cage and he goes flying onto a table. And you literally think he died. It's one of the craziest things you've ever seen. Paramedics come out and then they, they go to rush him off to the hospital, but then he gets off the gurney and he comes back to the cage and he climbs oh back goodness. on the top of it. And then Undertaker choke slams him through the cage and he falls through the cage and hits the mat. Oh and you think like he dies again. And uh, I don't want to spoil too much about <laughs> it, but it's the match. Like when we're working on Dark Side of the Ring, and we, me and my producer partner, have had to do this several times where, you know, sometimes a crew member would get sick and they got to go home and then we got to get someone else to fill in. And sometimes they don't know anything about wrestling. And so we only have like a quick, you know, usually it's like an hour or two to like download them into our world. And so we would show them the Hell in the Cell match between Mankind and Undertaker. And I would watch people who had never watched a wrestling match or really entertained it before be screaming at the screen and, you know, just absolutely jaw drop as to what they were watching. And then they would be, you know, they after they would see that match, they would get it. They would understand, okay, mm-hmm. 
this is what they're here for and this is why wrestling is so special and probably the greatest art form ever on planet earth um so your latest project is kids versus aliens it's a science fiction horror feature that follows what happens when aliens attack a halloween house party this movie was so much fun to uh, watch. holy crime and i loved it so much great um, awesome i'm so glad you do like i made it for like you know younger people like yourself and so i haven't had an opportunity to really like if there's only been a few um like people your age that i've talked to about the film um and uh it just yeah i get excited because like i feel like you know you guys are the audience for the for the movie so it was shot in your hometown in fact it was shot at your parents lake house which gets trash uh what was that conversation like with your parents oh man well i shot the short film for vhs2 at my parents house mm -hmm. and that was a nightmare and uh, my mom like hated it and i vowed to never do it again and um so when it came time when we were doing the feature and we we're location scouting, you know, we would find places and they would be great. And then as soon as the homeowners found out what the movie was about, they would decline to have the movie shot in their home and probably rightfully so. <laughs> and, um, and my parents saw that I was struggling to find a place. And so they offered up their home. They're like, they came to me and, Told, asked, they they told me that I could use the house if uh, if I needed to, and uh, I took them up on it, and so we got them an Airbnb down the road, so, and uh, we took over their home for like two months, and we literally, like, we had production, like, literally, like, home base, everything was on their home, so the whole front yard, we had all the trailers and the tents set up, and, you know, just totally destroyed the yard, and then like you see in the movie, we allowed all these teenagers just go nuts in the house and spray paint on the walls and whatnot. But oh my, God. <laughs> my parents were so awesome about it. And uh, they were, yeah, they were just, I think they, they realized, you know, that it was going to be like a special memory for our family. And then we, we get to, you know, <laughs> I guess immortalize, you know, our family's home, like uh, for in, in a movie, which is yeah. cool. Um, so Kids vs. Aliens draws influence from the cartoons of your childhood, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Masters of the Universe, and Thundercats. Uh, the play sets that accompany uh, the play sets that accompanied these shows were usually multi-level layers or common commands common command centers armed yeah. with secret battle stations, shockwave guided weapons, and communication <laughs> countermeasure equipment. They often had crystal beds with purple thrones and were overloaded with cool details like trapdoors, secret ooze pits, and brain scramblers. Yeah. It looks like you were able to build your own playset for this movie. Uh, what was the holy grail of playsets when you were growing up? One that you had or always wanted to have? Yeah, I, well, gosh, there are some, uh, you know, the there was a playset for G.I. Joe that was like a, a full-on um the aircraft carrier and it was oh, like awesome. massive it was so huge um i've only ever met one person in my life who's ever had one of those and that was adam wingard who directed the king kong versus godzilla <laughs> movie and you could actually literally see there's a scene in that movie where king kong and godzilla are fighting on top of an aircraft carrier so that obviously <laughs> you know that place that had a big inspiration on him too. Uh, but for me, my favorite one as a kid was the slime pit from Masters of the Universe. And even as a kid, it, like when I would see the commercials for this thing, it would really freak me out. Cause it's like, it, it's like, a, it's almost like a, like an ancient ruin uh, of like this sort of giant dinosaur skull and you pour slime into it and there's like a, a skeleton hand that holds your fig figure in place and the slime you know drips down all over your action figure and it's just a horrific kind of image um and <laughs> the action of it is you know as a kid you're like pretending to like melt people you know <laughs> and uh and it always like stuck with me i like even the box art is like so beautiful and haunting looking 
um that like yeah when it came time to make this movie i wanted there to be like a <laughs> like a centerpiece like play set that was like similar to the ones that i loved as a kid and like he-man masters of the universe wasn't the only toy line to have a slime pit like um like uh ninja turtles had the flush matic like as well too which i loved <laughs> as well uh same concept you stick your action figure in dime that one it's you pour slime through a toilet that <laughs> drips over your figure but um yeah i just <laughs> that that definitely had stuck with me like ever since i was a kid and i still have you know my slime pit and it's yeah always ready for action so you've previously mentioned that you're a fan and collector of soundtracks, the Last Dragon soundtrack being one of your favorites. You had four composers on Hobo with a Shotgun performing in different styles, and your use of music is a large part of your signature. Andrew Gordon McPherson uh, composed the music for Kids vs. Aliens. He yeah. described that score as a nonstop melodic tour of, cl of classic fantasy adventure and horror film music, action figure commercials, and since smothered pop and audio anxiety. I heard you would blast techno on, on set. Uh, do you think more songs have been written about love, lust, or heartbreak? Yeah, um, gosh, like Andrew Gordon McPherson, his, uh, he actually went to the same community college as mm -hmm. me at Screen Arts. Uh, he was just a few years below me. Um, uh, but we like kind of grew up in the industry together and we did a movie. I edited this feature film called Goon Last of the Enforcers, this crazy hockey movie. And <laughs> Andrew was my assistant editor on the film. And he's also like a DJ and producer of other music. You know, he makes a lot of music in his, uh, regular, like, you know, life. And, and, uh, so when we were working on Goon, I discovered just like how good he was with um, music and, and like putting music to image and moving image. And uh, we shared a lot of the same like sensibilities. And so when it came time to do Dark Side of the Ring, I hired him to do all the music for it. And he, so he's done every soundtrack for every Dark Side of the Ring episode and the Tales from the Territories one as well. And then I brought him on to do Kids vs. Aliens, and they'll probably do, we'll probably work with each other until we're in the dirt <laughs> later on in life. Um, and, uh, but yeah, he, uh, he was just like, when we were, when I was in development on the movie on Kids vs. Aliens, he was making me music, like even in developing. And so, and then when I got <laughs> to shooting, I had like, 12 songs um that i could play like on set and uh get everyone like into the mood you know and some so sometimes it's just like i felt like you know we if we're doing something scary i just needed to set that tone like on set especially when we're in the ufo in the in the spaceship like when we would get on set i would just you know to kind of ease our way into it i would just play some of the music that andrew had made for us and that would just really set the tone and kind of get everyone into the the mindset of the of the scenes um sorry the and i also had a question uh do you think more songs have been written about love lust or heartbreak like the actual emotions yeah the emotions <laughs> yeah oh yeah absolutely uh like even those uh are like playing through like the 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 score and kids versus aliens mm -hmm. um like there are, you know we i have like some themes in it that you know are to evoke some of those kinds of emotions you know and so yeah absolutely um you have so many exciting projects in the works there's a christmas horror movie a martial arts film set in the high school and an <laughs> underwater haunted house story you want to make uh what's next for you and what would your ultimate tree fort movie look like oh that's a great question um yeah i'm writing a, like a christmas horror movie right now i have like several films in development with studios um but gosh it's so hard to get any of them to like do anything for them uh so i don't really know like what could be next you know i'm uh there's so many dreams i have of things i'd love to do and some of the projects projects i'm developing like i I hope, you know, will will come to fruition, but 
I think like the ultimate uh, treehouse movie. I actually, I have a pitch that I wanted to make for years, which is it's kind of like turning a house into a treehouse. And so basically the idea of this film, or it could be a TV series, is that it's like, um, imagine like a, there was like a game show and this game show had this like crazy idea, this game show company where they're gonna give a family in a community like $50 million in cash. And all this family has to do is protect this money in a briefcase or a suitcase. And anyone from the community can come and try and take it from them, from them. But if they can guard it within their home for 24 hours and make it to sunrise and they still have the money, they get to keep it. So they get like a week to like fortify their home. And so they turn their home into like a fortress with moats and drawbridges and all these like traps and and then it follows other people in the community and and their you know contraptions that they're building and catapults and all kinds of crazy stuff to try and get like to penetrate the house so that they could try and get the money as well too so it's almost like the ultimate like i see it as like like when you see the you know the uh, what the family does of this house, it would look like a tree for it. Like it would have like, you know, crow's nests and, mm-hmm. you know, drawbridges and traps and all those kinds of things. And, uh, and then just, yeah, getting to see the ultimate war <laughs> on like a tree house, like would be so cool. <laughs> uh, you sometimes wear a giant millennium fal- a falcon on a chain around <laughs> your neck and you've worked at Skywalker Ranch. Will you support my ongoing campaign to ask Disney to make a horror universe oh that's a great idea oh man you sh- they should do that they should get you to do that that would be so cool i definitely support that idea <laughs> um so this last question is a sophie's choice two must die so that one may live the movie the dog who stopped the war two the movie the movie the warriors or ghostbusters two oh i ghostbusters have to watch two kill two of them Two of them, one survives. Oh, man, that is so tough. Because all three of those films are so important to me. Um, like Ghostbusters being the first Ghostbusters 2. Movie. Oh, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters 2. 2. I, lo- I mm-hmm. love Ghostbusters 2. Um, I still... I still play the soundtrack like <laughs> every week. <laughs> oh, that would be so hard to lose. Ghostbusters 2 or Dog to Stop the War in the Warriors. Yeah. Um the Warriors for me is so oh, it's so important too. That <laughs> movie I saw when I was in college and I remember the moment being at that, you know, in college and like I said, like our teacher was like weeding out the week. And I remember being tested on my like love for wanting to pursue filmmaking as a living and thinking like, ah, oh, this is going to be so hard. Like I'm going to, it's going to be hard to like raise a family and like all this kind of stuff, like within the industry. And then uh, like being in like a, like basically discovering that movie, the warriors, like in that time. And when I saw it, um, it just made me like realize that you know if movies could be this cool it's worth fighting for and it's worth making sacrifices <laughs> to be able to to do something that could be as cool as that so i guess i'm gonna have to lose the dog to stop the war and ghostbusters 2 to save Whoa. the warriors <laughs> um uh, that's, because, that's unexpected <laughs> yeah it's hard i know but uh because <laughs> ghostbusters 2 i do love and the dog to stop the war is also just so close to me and a big inspiration on kids versus aliens and uh but the warriors is part of my heart and soul and um i think about the warriors probably every day and um it's like a dream to do a movie that could uh stand the test of time like the warriors does or influence you know other filmmakers like myself like that movie did um is there anything you want to ask me before we go Oh, well, I'm like super excited for you to make movies and like I want to see when you like rock one of those short films, I want to be able to see it. Um, When do you think you're going to make one of these things? 
Well, I'm currently writing the one about the kid in the uh, in the uh, shoe Listen. doorway thing. Yeah. Um, I so that I'm planning on filming that with two of my friends and doing that in a night. So ah. once I get that script done, that's happening. And what's your favorite movie of all time? Oh goodness gracious! <laughs> I um so I'll I got three. Yeah. For slasher movies, it's uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Ah, uh, I just got the UHD uh, of that t- uh, today, actually. <laughs> For non horror movies, it's The Big Lebowski. Ah, I love it too. So and, good. Uh, dang it. The third one, it's. <sighs> dang it. Okay, there's going to be four because it's either The Thing or Aliens. Ah, uh, yeah. It's either those two, because <sighs> I, I, it's hard to choose which one. Uh, I know. Kids versus aliens is one. I'd say kids <laughs> versus aliens is one of the top five. No way. I would say it's one of the top five. Oh, that was wow. one. That was so fun to watch, and like I've actually rewatched it a couple times since I watched it. No way. That's amazing. Like I watched it. Like I would. I had seen Hobo with a Shotgun trailer i hadn't actually seen the movie yet but i watched yeah. the trailer and um so going through like going through your works and when i asked you to come on the show going through your works i watched hubble with a the shotgun then kids versus aliens and kids versus aliens is the one that i've watched like three times oh that's so <laughs> i love to hear that that's amazing did yeah. like um like uh being like you know like a filmmaker like wanting to make films like did you like the aspect of seeing like the kids like making their movie as well too and the- of course i did why wouldn't i <laughs> yeah of course i did also i forgot another one i'm adding another one scott pilgrim versus the world oh that's great phenomenal film and it's my favorite also it's based in canada and i want to go visit the places in canada yeah that's so cool i own the books too ah it's so good oh that's awesome <laughs> I love that, like, you're, like, I love meeting someone your age that's, like, excited about movies, you know? Like, I, like, I often wonder, like, are there still, like, are there people like myself and uh, some of the filmmakers I know that were, you know, grew up in their backyards, like, making, like, genre action movies and stuff, you know? And so to see that, you know, that's something you're trying to do is uh, super cool. I find that, like, really inspiring and you know, that you like uh, Kids vs. Aliens so much um, makes me feel good because, like, I, 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 I had hoped to meet someone like yourself that, you know, would, um, would like it and, you know, be, maybe be inspired by some of it. Um, that's so cool. Uh, what are your suggestions for movies I should watch? Because oh, I've, I've been running goodness. low. I've been running short. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what um what what was it oh texas chainsaw massacre was your favorite um slasher slasher have you seen the original my bloody valentine i have yeah i love that movie yeah Yeah, that's also the director was shot in nova scotia where i heard about that yeah (laughs) that that's so cool gosh (laughs) i uh i'm trying to think like um like what would uh well Gosh, you know, a new movie that I love, um, which, you know, be, I think would be cool for you to see. Uh, it's very, I think it's like the Warriors of today. It's called Athena. Have you heard of this movie? I have not. No, it came out on Netflix this year. Oh, directed by Romain Gavess, who I think is probably the best music video director probably ever. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's like, a, it's a movie about a bunch of kids in uh, Paris who are avenging the death of uh, one of their uh, friends who was killed by a, a police officer. And so all these kids like rise up and overthrow the police station and cause a bunch of havoc. And it's like, like the very first shot in the movie is like a 15 minute one take shot that'll like blow your mind and then every other shot is like no less than like i don't know like five minutes long or something (laughs) it's a it's a cinematic feat it's it'll you know now that you know you know like 
a bit more about how movies work and how they're made, like you'll watch that movie and you'll just be dumbfounded as to like, how were they able to pull this off? And so that to me has been like a new inspiration from a new movie uh, now that I'm like, you know, it's kind of doing the same thing that, you know, when I first saw Evil Dead 2 and I was inspired by how the camera moved, you know, how Sam Raimi moved his camera and I'd never seen anything like that before. I'm getting kind of just, it's not the same thing, but it's like, the, the filmmaker is doing things that like I are so cinematically um, just like, you know, invigorating and, and cool that like, you know, I want to know everything about it. And, you know, I'd love to try and do something like it someday. Also, uh, there's a seventh movie. I keep adding on Ooh. to it, but Over the Edge, the movie Over the Edge. Oh, the one with the, the bear? Uh, no. Oh no! Sorry, the one about the kids. The uh, kids. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The eighties uh, exploitation oh. movie. <laughs> yeah, I love that movie too. <laughs> have you liked that movie too? Have you seen The Wanderers, which is also kind of close to The no, Warriors? I have well, not too? seen it. No. I'm oh, The Wanderers is really good. Some it came out came out the same time as The Warriors, and so there was like two gang movies that came out around <laughs> the same time, and The Warriors was the most popular one. Uh, but the Wanderers is probably it's got even a bit more it's got more charm than the than the <laughs> Warriors, but uh, that's really good. And uh, gosh, if I were like in my top like five, I think is like I've got the Warriors, and then the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie from nineteen ninety is like my second favorite movie of all time. Then I probably like Ghostbusters and uh, Rocky Four is in there for sure rocky four is uh is one of my favorite movies of all time that's awesome uh thank you thank you so much for sitting down with me i'm so i'm so sorry it took so long (laughs) no this is great this is so fun this is one of my favorite interviews i've ever done um i appreciate it you know all the research you've done and you made it so fun and (laughs) man seeing those posters up there like that is uh it's pretty inspiring, uh, I gotta say. I, I... <laughs> That's so cool. Thank you so much.